Right. Lucy Kalanithi, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. So your late husband was Paul Kalanithi, and he uh, wrote the memoir, When Breath Becomes Air. And he wrote the manuscript in his last few months of life, right before he died of stage four lung cancer. Your husband started the book in, as, in a hospital room as a patient staring at his own CT scan images. So let's begin there. What led to that moment when you and Paul learned that he definitely had cancer? Yeah, sure. So that was in 2013 in the spring. And he was a rising chief resident in neurosurgery at Stanford. So he was like just about to finish his long years of training as a neurosurgeon when he started to develop these really ominous symptoms. Like he lost 15 pounds kind of inexplicably and developed a cough and just wasn't feeling good. But at the same time, he had lost 15 pounds like a few years before as an intern just from working so hard. And it like took a while to get to figuring out exactly what was going on. But ultimately, it was stage four lung cancer, really surprisingly, of course. And I'm a physician too. And he was diagnosed at the hospital where we work, where he worked and I work. And so it was this sort of strange, unmediated experience of having this CT scan and then like logging in with your own credentials to the hospital computer and pulling it up and kind of wordlessly scrolling through the images. And we knew right away what the diagnosis likely was and what it meant in terms of a prognosis of, you know, months to a few years with maybe some more hopeful advances, but you never know. And and he, for people who've read the memoir or who haven't, in the in the prologue, he describes that moment of like looking at his own scan. And then he says something like, the future I had imagined, the one just about to be realized, evaporated. And that really was the feeling in that moment was just this like disappearing of like, who you thought you were, you know, it's like who you are is so tied up in your future and you're the same person you were five minutes ago and you are also a totally different person in a new world, you know, when you, when you get a diagnosis like that. And that's one of the major themes running throughout the book is what, what is it, what does your identity mean when you have an event like this happen to you? And we'll talk about that here in a bit, but another theme that runs throughout the book is this question of what makes human life meaningful. And this is a question your husband grappled with long before that moment where you two were in a hospital room looking at CT scans. Like, can you tell us about his intellectual journey seeking answers to this question? Yeah, sure. So this was one of the things that made me fall in love with him. Um, uh, Cause he, I just thought he was a really interesting, curious, moral person. And like, I think a lot of us are, asking ourselves that question, you know, like, what's the meaning of life? What's the meaning of my life? And he, as a young person, had actually thought maybe he would be a philosopher or an English professor. He went to Stanford as an undergrad and studied English literature and and human biology, thinking he had some interest in like the mind-brain connection and how do you connect your own identity and morality to like living in a physical <laughs> body and then ultimately then went on to study a graduate degree in literature and in history and philosophy of science and medicine. So was pretty into philosophy and bioethics and literature and then shocked himself by going into medicine, but had become so intoxicated by the thought of the brain as a physical, as physical matter, but also the seat of identity and love and honor and morality. And so ended up at medical school, which is where I met him. And then was one of those people who walks into the operating room and like never walks out. So ultimately became a neurosurgeon, again, sort of out of this like real curiosity. But I think he had initially thought he would be a professor engaging with ideas. And then at a certain point in his mid-20s thought, I think what I want to do is be involved with real people facing big identity upheavals and big questions about how to proceed with thorny medical decision making. And, you know, when you're a neurosurgeon, you deal with tumors and trauma and seizures and aneurysms and epilepsy and mental illness and all these things where it's like your brain is you, you know? And if something goes wrong with it, then something goes wrong with your your identity in your life. And I think he that was who he wanted to be around was those patients. 
that's what one of the things that's one thing that really impressed me about Paul was because you know a lot of people when they they grapple with this question what gives life meaning they do it in a very abstract way so they they sit and they read the books and they discuss like Paul wanted to like touch it like he yeah. wanted to experience firsthand that's right and he was interested in suffering too you know like just I don't know. I, I think the fact that everybody suffers is like so obvious, but also kind of hidden, especially when we have so many fixes to our problems and we have like glossy social media. And I think, I think he was interested in what do you do with suffering that you can't ameliorate? Like there's some really gritty, interesting human connection to be found there. And I think like heartbreak and suffering is what most of literature is about. And that was part of it too. It's like being around sufferers or fellow sufferers, which I guess is like everybody. And what did he learn about the connection of, you know, between meaning life and death while he was in medical school? Um, and also like, what did you, question, what, what, yeah. what, did, what did you learn too? Cause you're also in medical school yeah. at the same time. You know, it's hard because medical school is just so practical. Like there's so much to learn that just learning the science is kind of overwhelming. And so I kind of think there's like the looming specter of these big moral questions, but at the same time, you're just trying to impress your professors and learn what you can. So in a way, medical school was initially not about big questions. It was about like grasping the concepts and then, but having the idea that you were going to end up needing to bring your full self to this. And I, I remember in medical school feeling like it was the first time that I had used all parts of my brain at one time, like a really intellectual part and moral compass and tapping into my emotions and reactions. And I just remember thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm not sure there's a part of my brain that is not actively engaged in this. And, and that was really exciting for me too. And then I was just going to mention this other thing that also was the reason I fell in love with Paul. So when, when we first started school, I knew he was kind of like this smart, nice guy in our class and there's a hundred people in the class. So you're kind of getting a sense of who, you know, who's the jock and who's the, you know, whoever. And, and then about three weeks into school, I realized that Paul on his medical student ID was wearing a fake mustache. And he had been a comedy writer in college and done a lot of sketch comedy and showed up in medical school and immediately pulled this like fake big bushy like fake mustache out of his pocket onto his face right before they shot the photo at Yale for the medical student ID. And it was this kind of like technically really transgressive thing to do, of course, entering professional school. And and it stuck around on his ID the whole time. He's applying to be a neurosurgeon three years later and all of the senior neurosurgeons are seeing this like ID face sheet and you know, with his fake mustache on it. And we never talked about why he did that apart from just like this pure slapstick of it. But I always wonder, like, was that was that something that he was doing because he was worried that medicine was also going to change him? You know, I think medicine has a lot of really formal structures, and hierarchy, and it's just arduous and tedious at times. And so, I don't know. I think when we were entering medical school, we were dealing with the pure complexity and work of it, but also... It is something you have to kind of figure out how you're going to become you and also be a physician at the same time, you know? So I think that was the other question we were thinking about. Yeah, I mean, it's a way to keep his humanity. And he talks about in the book, you know, one of the reasons why he fell in love with you is you were looking at an EKG scan and you started crying because you saw that someone someone died. Right, right. We were just studying in a textbook and it's like that stuff is is not abstract, you know? I was like, oh man, like... This scan that we're looking at literally is a picture of somebody dying. That's wild. And yeah, that's that's like when breath becomes air, right? It's just like you see those moments all the time. And I also remember we were studying on his sofa in his apartment. And it's like he got this look in his eyes and I was like, this guy loves me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay. Um, this is my guy. This is your guy. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've got a few friends that have gone to medical school and they're doctors now. And when they originally went into medical school, they had these very high ideals of wanting to care for their patients and bring a human element to the practice. But all of them admitted while they were in, in medical school that the grind of medical school and the residency kind of made them jaded and hardened 
to the suffering of their patients. It's sort of a, you know, they said it was a way for me just to get through the day. Is that a pretty common experience? Yes, it's really common. It's actually a big cultural phenomenon that's being addressed in medicine right now. I'm glad your friends are telling you about that. And like the major word that's getting used for it is burnout, which is like an actual syndrome of like depersonalization and lack of self-efficacy. There's like a, a syndrome. And there's some, it's interesting because I'm really interested in this question actually, because it's really depressing. It's like you take, I think this happens in a lot of fields actually. Like you take people who go into something really for the love of the game. And then something detaches them from being able to do what they hoped. And I think some people are using the term moral injury actually for this, which is, I think was first used for soldiers. And it's, it's this, it occurs when you're trying to do a job for which you have highly conflicted allegiances. Like, and in medicine, it's like you, you have a fiduciary responsibility to your patient who you love in many cases, you know, you're really connected to them as a person, but then you're also responsible to the hospital administration and you're also trying to fight an insurance company and you also are, you know, overwhelmed with how busy you are. And I think there's a form of like systemic pressure that actually puts people's moral impulses, <laughs> um, like, like squishes them a little bit. And I think... I think it's really hard and it's funny because maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago when this phenomenon was getting named and it was being called burnout, it was thought of as kind of like a a lack of personal resilience, like people, people need to work on their coping skills, you know, and, but I think the thinking since then is like, if you take a bunch of highly resilient people, like the people who enter the health health professions, it's not, I've heard someone say, you know, if there's a canary in the coal mine, you can't just teach the canary to meditate, which is so smart. And it's like, it's not, it's not just a, a personal issue. It's like a systemic, systemic structural thing. And so I think everybody's thinking about how to, how to reintroduce humanity, everything from, you know, the, the payment structures to clinic timing to, of course, the electronic medical record. So yeah, I, it's, it's something that doctors are talking about all the time at cocktail parties and elsewhere. Right. And Paul described, he had a friend that ended up committing suicide Yes, because of that, right? For yes. that pressure he felt. That's right. A brilliant surgeon who jumps off of a building and it was, I'm glad he wrote about it because that was so personally devastating to Paul and is one of like the other deaths in when breath becomes air. And I, I'm glad he wrote about it. And and how do you, I mean, it seems like Paul and and yourself were able to, I don't know, rise above that cynicism that can come with being in that situation. Uh, I mean, how did, how do you think you two were able to do that? You mean in our medical careers, even before Paul yeah, got sick? Yeah, in your sick? medical career. Yeah, even even before Paul got sick, in your medical careers. It seems like there was like this, Paul had this striving to like to keep his humanity in his profession. Totally. I think some of it was recognizing it as a personally important thing so that you can at least be trying to do that. And we had a lot of dinner table conversations about that. But also both of us really burned out at times. I had an episode of depression in residency and developed a lot of skills actually at that time, including meditation that helped me later when Paul got sick, actually. Like I had better coping skills as a result of having gone through that. And and Paul just kind of thought about it a lot. And, you know, there's a lot of gallows humor and camaraderie in medicine, which actually really helps. But then I think, you know, people aren't, you're not immune to it. I think you really do have to be looking for for ways to hold on to that or like stoke yourself as a person, you know? And then I think when Paul was a patient, he himself became the vulnerable person who is a hospital patient who's like literally naked in a hospital bed. And and then we had a couple of really difficult interactions with healthcare professionals that like I recognized that maybe the person who was treating him was burned out or having a really hard day or whatever. And I just remember thinking like, you know, it's it's something that I'm I'm wondering how this person is doing, but they like the moral obligation is so high to be to be a humane, just person, you know, that I was like, I kind of don't forgive this guy. <laughs> like <laughs> this is like it's not okay. 
I was, I, mean, I imagine his, you know, his study in literature and philosophy helped too, because he's, he's, he, 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 th- those issues were top of mind for him. Yeah, I think so. And I think like in a job like medicine, as in many others, I'm assume I would imagine like there's like the tedium of the day to day, but then there's also the sense of moral mission is always there. So it's like when you're on hold, you know, waiting to talk to the prior authorization for an insurance company, like you are realizing that you're on a moral mission, you know, you're like, it's not just a tedious task. It's like, it's like a crusade on behalf of your patient, you know? So I think you feel it all the time and it's actually really sustaining. But yeah, I think Paul's sense of, of, you know, like, yeah, the, the human mission of medicine and his connection to literature and the human experience and the human condition. Sure. It was like there, it's there all the time. It's, It's really fun. And how did, you know, as a neurosurgeon, Paul had to often deliver bad news to patients and their families. Did he have an approach that he kind of settled on and how to make that more humane and more compassionate? Yeah. You know, I can't remember exactly if he had a, a really standardized approach for himself. He, when you're a neurosurgeon, you see a lot of terrible things all the time. So anything from a terrible bike accident to a ruptured aneurysm to a brain tumor in a young person, it's sort of like as bad as it gets on a daily basis. And so he delivered a lot of bad news. And I think he writes in the book about really trying to figure out how much a person can handle and understanding that the delivery of bad news isn't even a one-time event. It kind of happens over time. And then the the news itself or its impact also changes over time. So I think Paul said something like, a terrain of tragedy is best allotted by the spoonfall. And he also talked about something like meeting a patient in the narthex, not the nave, meaning like wherever they are, you go find them there and then you try to bring them where they need to be. But a lot of it is on their terms. And I think he really did think about the lot of, that a lot. And I think it's actually being taught in medical school, like formal ways to deliver bad news. Like for example, there's this acronym called SPIKES, S-P-I-K-E-S, which is like, it's something like set up the scene and then the P is assess the patient's perception. And then I is get an invitation to give the, give the bad news. And then K is give the knowledge and E is acknowledge emotion. And so, you know, I think it is a it's a art and a science. So there's a, we do a lot of like practice role playing in medical schools about delivering bad news. And so I think it is one of those things where just because you're a nice person doesn't mean that you can do that artfully without practice or reflection, you know, but it's one of the things that Paul had decided was really important to him to try to be good at. Yeah. I I imagine it's super tricky because some people like, you you don't want to like you you want to give them hope but like not too much hope right because you want to still i mean I, that's, I imagine that's just super hard to figure out like what would be best for that person totally and sometimes you can just ask them what they think would be best but that's exactly right there is this huge tension between you know letting them in on everything that you may know about the course of their illness while at the same time Hope is like, it is a human thing to hope, you know? And I think, I guess the thing that that doctors think about or that we think about is like, there's a lot of different ways to hope, right? There's like the battle metaphor, especially in cancer of like, we'll fight it and we'll beat it. And we're not going to talk about any other options other than that. But I think there's a lot of things people are fighting for. And, you know, a big one is fighting to make sure that their family will be okay no matter what happens. And that requires like a a sense of facing up to all the possibilities that could happen, which oftentimes people are way better at doing for their families than themselves, which is like so loving and brave. And then and then I think there's this sort of like this battle for meaning, you know, and like trying to figure out a new purpose in the face of whatever is happening. And I think there's like all kinds of courage and bravery that happen. And it's not just one brittle version of like, 
I'm going to fight this disease and put my head down and that's it. I think, but again, it comes, it comes over time, you know? I thought it was interesting that Paul said, uh, you know, talking about his experience, his encounters with patients and delivering bad news. He said he felt almost like a, a pastor and that if he'd you know, had another life, he probably would have been a pastor. I know. I thought that was lovely. I don't know if that's true or not literally, but it's not totally dissimilar, you know? No, it's not. It's it's all about the human dealing with that aspect of of human life that's not science, right? It's like the love, hope, courage, all that stuff that that's part of human reality. Right. So let's talk about when Paul gets his diagnosis. He wrote when he came face to face with mortality. He got that diet and he had lung cancer. It was, it was terminal. He said it. It's, I thought it was interesting. He said that said uh, it changed everything and also nothing. What did he mean by that? Or what do you think he meant by that? Yeah, it's interesting, right? That was in an essay that Paul wrote that ended up in the New York Times and ultimately led to the chance to write the memoir. I guess he meant a couple of things by that. So he was sort of getting at the idea of like, you know, I knew I was going to die and I I just didn't know when. And then I get this terrible diagnosis and I know I'm going to die. And I also still don't know when. So he was sort of saying like, well, is anything really different? Um, But I think the thing that was so different is that his relationship to the future had totally changed. And people always tell you, you know, like take it one day at a time. And his, the big thing he grappled with was like, well, what is it that I'm supposed to do with, with the one day at a time, especially when I don't know how much time I have left. And so it really changes. Like, am I still going to be a neurosurgeon when I'm, I'm not actually going to do it for 30 years anymore? Like, should I keep even going down that path? And so I think that was some of what he was getting at. And then ultimately, so he lived for 22 months after getting that diagnosis. He died when he was 37. He was diagnosed when he was 35, or actually just turned 36. And he initially went back to work as a neurosurgeon. And then when he became too debilitated to do that, about a year later, he had very fortuitously written a couple of things, one of which went viral and let him ultimately start writing the manuscript for the memoir. And then we also had a baby during that time. And so a number of things were like growing and changing and happening even as his body was diminishing. So yeah, just to give a sense of that too. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of, that's the paradox that Paul talks about, about having a terminal disease. Cause, okay, you know, very acutely that you are dying, right? Like you said, you, you know, you're, we're all dying, right? This moment we're, we're all of us listening are dying, right? We're kind of, it's like, right, ham- but it's like ham- so abstract. It's so yeah. abstract, yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, you're dying, but you're still alive. So you have to, like, you're not, you're not dead until you're dead. So you have to continue to live until then. And like, what does that mean? Yes. And, and when it's such a, yeah, I mean, it's like, I think it, I, I think it's really interesting to try to think about how to, how to rebuild what your life is when something big up, upends it, you know, and that happened for me after Paul died. And there's this, have you heard it or have you seen or heard of this young lawyer activist, Adi Barkin, who has ALS? No, I have not. He went to Yale Law School around the time that we were there for med school and then became an activist. And he's a he's like a progressive activist. And he got diagnosed with ALS when he was 32 with Lou Gehrig's disease. And now he's 35 and he's totally paralyzed in a wheelchair and he speaks using eye gaze technology where he's moving his pupils. And so he's had this huge thing to adjust to, obviously. And he wrote a memoir that's coming out soon. It's called Eyes to the Wind. But there's an interesting part in it where right after he gets diagnosed, he tells his best friend, he's like, okay, I got to do three things. I have to do a bunch of medical stuff and try to mitigate what's happening. I have to mourn what I thought I was going to have that I'm not going to have anymore in my life. And then he says, then I have to enjoy the moment. Those are the three things I have to do. And then he wakes up like two weeks later and says, oh, wait a second, I need to go back to activism. Like, that's my thing. That's the purpose of my life. And ever since then, he's been doing a ton of activism that's actually been even more powerful in a way because of his illness. But it's interesting because I actually think he's right. It's like, it's like you mitigate what you can, you, you mitigate suffering, you try to cope, you try to be mindful and present in the moment, and you try to build a purpose in your life. And, and I kind of think those are the keys to coping, like, uh, 
in a lot of different situations. So I think that's what Paul was doing too. And the question is like, just the whiplash of having a really upending change in your life. And then in particular, trying to figure out what your purpose will be. Because if you lose that, it's really hard. I think I think it's Viktor Frankl or Nietzsche or somebody, it's like Frankl quoting Nietzsche or something who said something like, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. And it's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy flipped over. It's like, if you feel a purpose and you feel connected to your sense of purpose in your life, a lot of things could be going wrong, like including in your body and you can still feel really solid. So I don't know. I think about that a lot in my own life or with my patients, you know? And this idea of, you know, living while you're still alive. I mean, is that one of the reasons why Paul wanted to have a child, even though he knew he might not see her grow up? Definitely. It was kind of a crazy decision. We had a lot of support. So we had a lot of luck and support and privilege that made it even possible to think about doing that when he was so sick. But he said that we had a conversation actually that was really formative for me that I've held on to since then too, where he initially wanted to have a child more than I did at that time, or he just was like, he was just really certain he wanted to, but he needed to make sure it would be okay for me going forward. And um, I said, you know, I'm actually more worried about you and I'm, you know, don't you think that if we have a child, it's going to make dying even more painful for you? And he said, wouldn't it be great if it did? And I, that was just so formative for me, just thinking about anybody who, anybody who decides to have a child, they are, they're not doing it because they think it's going to be easy, you know, or like climbing a mountain or going through really arduous schooling. It's like, we do so many things that are difficult and beautiful at the same time. And, or the difficulty is part of the beauty, you know? And I think Paul recognized that having a child, even when you're dying, like that's, that's what that is, you know? So that was a big, big part of that. Yeah, that's the other thing that runs through the book, that, that connection between suffering and love. Right. Right. Like the people you love, like they're the ones that cause you to suffer the most, but like you're willing to do that because you love them. Totally. It's either part of it or it's like worth the, worth the risk. Yeah. This idea of, you know, a big event happens to you like this, you have, your, your priorities change uh, and even your identity changes. And for Paul, it was very visceral because he went from doctor to patient. Was that, was that really hard for him? Um, yes, it was really hard. I think yes and no. I mean, the fact of being a doctor makes it way easier to handle being part of the medical system. So a lot of being a doctor was very helpful, of course. But then I think Paul, A, sort of was surprised in a way what, by his own hubris where I think he thought he kind of knew what it was going to be like to be a patient. And then he was really shocked by how disorienting it was to face a serious illness. And he also had a lot of struggle just with ha- with the fact of feeling like an object instead of a subject. And for a young neurosurgeon, you're pretty used to being an agent, pretty in charge of everything. And then to be the one who's the object and to be physically debilitated or just to be, you know, sitting and waiting or to be not sure what's happening on a big or small scale was very hard. Was there a moment where he finally kind of, I don't know, I guess the word is like submitted, like he became an object and he became okay with that? Kind of. I think, yes, I guess, because he thought about it a lot and he got used to it. And he also forged a different kind of agency as a writer. And, you know, in he he sort of like forged agency. But at the same time, I think one thing that did help was putting words on it, like the mere act of describing it first to himself and then as a writer was really helpful. And that was part of, you know, initially as a young person, he thought he would be a writer and then he entered medicine so that he could, you know, have an unmediated experience of big questions. And then I think once it became so fiery and he was the one who was sick, he kind of like retreated to words again and flipping back and forth in that way was very helpful. And he was like gregarious, but pretty introverted in a sense where like 
self-reflection and writing was the way that he was, the way that he came to terms and actually processed things was like kind of internal. And so when he was writing the manuscript, even like I was reading it day to day or week to week, and it was kind of a conversation tool, but like the manuscript was a big part of how he coped. Yeah, he was able to forge a new identity, a new purpose. And I thought it was interesting the way he described it, I think it was really useful is that this didn't happen, like it didn't like switch on, like, you know, from one thing to the next, like it was a process that went back and forth. It wasn't like he just knew all of a sudden, well, now I write. It was more of like, well, am I a doctor? Well, I was a doctor. Uh, I mean, I think he did a great job showing that it's a very fluid process and very messy and it's not very clean and one and done. Totally. I think that's a great way to say it and important. And he did, he talked about verb tense, right? And he's like, I am a neurosurgeon. I was a neurosurgeon. I had been, I will be. He like literally could not figure out how to conjugate the verb for his, his own identity as a neurosurgeon, you know, like was it gone? Was it still there? If he's not practicing, is he still a neurosurgeon? If he never will be, then does it matter? Like, yeah. okay, totally. And one thing that helped throughout this is that Paul had a great oncologist that was very attuned to the human element of dealing with a terminal illness. How did she help with that? Yeah. So the the main thing was she just talked to him for real. Like he was a real person with agency, like we had said. And she would always ask him what he was up to and what was important to him. And initially, she was the first person who told him he could return to being a neurosurgeon because initially we thought he would die within a few months. We actually weren't, even as physicians, weren't even aware of the strides in cancer science and the tolerability and efficacy of the treatment that he would end up using. So he had a great year on this one treatment. And she said, you can still be a neurosurgeon. He looked at her like she was insane. And then, and then he, and then he was able to, and then similarly, once he was writing, she prescribed, here's an example. She prescribed a stimulant medication, kind of similar to Ritalin, but not exactly the same so that he could focus on writing when he was so punishingly tired and was having side effects from other treatments. And she just was really creative in trying to tailor the the medical treatment so that he could keep being who he wanted to be as much as that was possible. So yeah, Paul, he did a stint. He went back to work for a while as a neurosurgeon, but eventually the, the disease progressed. How did, how did he spend his last few weeks of life? And I mean, you hear people when they know like, well, I've got a month, I'm going to live life to the fullest. Is that what he tried to do or did he do something different? He did something kind of different. I mean, okay, it, de- it just sort of depends. I think there's this idea of like people have this big bucket list and they're going to try to do it and they'll travel the world or whatever. And I think Paul did something that was kind of the opposite, which was essentially to like, there's another really interesting cancer patient writer named Kate Bowler who talked about how when she got diagnosed, she like, she chose to double down on the life she had, which I actually think Paul did too. You know, it was like, if you've made considered decisions through your whole life about what you want to do and who you want to be and what's your career and who are you going to marry? And like, if you're happy with that and you get diagnosed with a terminal illness, it's like exciting and romantic to decide that like the way you wanted to spend your long life is also the way you want to spend your short life. You know, it's like a, that's wonderful. So that's kind of what he was doing. But I think his world became narrower and narrower. And in the very last few weeks of his life, he was at home writing, like kind of furiously writing, actually, knowing that he was really getting very sick. And I remember he, there like a bunch of people wanted to visit and he kind of didn't have the energy for it, even though he really wanted to. And he ended up writing this beautiful email that was like kind of this love letter to his friends, but it ultimately said like, you know, like, I love you guys. And one more glass of Ardbeg 10 is not going to change that. It's like, I think similarly, you know, I think his world just became smaller um, because he was so sick. And so the very last weekend was, you know, at home writing. And then he, he died a little bit even sooner than we thought. I think we thought he had a few weeks left and then he died kind of suddenly because he had stopped taking one of his cancer medications, hoping that he could participate in a clinical trial. And that was just such bad luck. And 
then he ultimately, we called 911 and he wasn't really able to breathe comfortably at all. So we went to the hospital, which wasn't totally ideal to be away from home. But then our our daughter's five now and the, she knows the story. So the way my daughter would tell it is daddy was really sick and we went to the hospital and usually a baby is not allowed to go to a hospital. But for me, they made a special rule. So she like knows about the special rule where our daughter came to the hospital too. So he died in the hospital, but but the thing that he really wanted in the last like moments and last day was to to be with our daughter who was eight months at the time. I mean, what what insights do you think Paul's experience, his last moments can shed for people who are facing a similar situation? Um. Uh, I'm just trying to think of like what to share. I mean, I think the thing that like I felt like Paul was a leader on or had con- deeply considered was like this question of like quality, quality of life at the end of your life. And so he faced a medical decision actually, which was whether to go on a ventilator and whether to be on life support technology. And usually that stuff is not particularly helpful when you're really elderly or when you're dying of a really progressive illness like cancer at the end of your life. And, but I think there's a pressure, like a, like a cultural pressure and even some like medical cultural pressure to like, quote unquote, do everything and, and use a technology like that or dialysis or whatever it might be. And, and Paul ultimately said no at the very end that he didn't want to use any other life extending technology. And I think It's funny how brave a decision that can be because it's sort of an ancient wisdom, right? Is like at a certain point, nature takes its course. But I think in a way, like in a modern medical culture, it's sort of brave to decide not to do that. And But as a doctor, Paul had a sense that it wasn't going to help. And so then you like, then I think, you know, what ended up for him was like the medical treatment was like for the nurses to sneak a baby in. So... I think that's one thing to think about is just like like really trying to figure out what makes sense for you medically. And it may not be the most intensive medical treatment. It may be something else like staying home. And yeah, I mean, uh, these so are that's one big thing, you know? Right. And that, and it's a very practical, um, sometimes like boring because that, that's advanced directive type stuff, right? Totally. You, and like people don't think about that because like, oh, but like you, at that moment, like that's when you'd want to have one. Uh, so you can det- you can be an agent, right? In determining exactly. how your how your end of life is. That's right, and it's like not sexy, you know. Like I, I'm a primary care doctor, so I think that stuff is sexy, but most people don't. And I think, but yeah, if you, I think instead of just the like pure paperworky part of it, it's like if you know who you are and you know what's important to you. Like for Paul. Paul just wanted to be mentally lucid. He's like, I don't want to be alive if I'm not mentally lucid. I want to write and I want to be with my family and I want to hold my kid. And if this is the end of that, then this is the end. And so that was, that. it made it very clear for him because he knew who he was. But it's also really hard. It's also like, you know, it's even as doctors, it was hard to figure out like, oh, is this really the moment? Like, I guess this is it. I guess this is really the moment. And it's just so shocking when it actually is happening, you know? And I think, um, yeah, it's just like when it's you, it's just so, so emotionally intense. And then I think for me, it's like, I was so, I was so fused with Paul. Like we were such a team at that time. And I was really devoted to trying to figure out how to help him write and how to help him make medical decisions. And like, I was sort of blocking and tackling everything the best I could. And then suddenly he like, he dies and he just like disappears. It's like, he just disappears. And it's so shocking. I mean, it's like, oh my gosh, he was here yesterday and now he's now he just disappeared. Like it's, it's almost incomprehensible. I don't know for anybody who's lost somebody, I think that itself is so wildly upending. Yeah. I, we've talked to someone who's, you know, works with widowers and he, the one thing he mentioned is that they disappear, but like, they're still there. Like you go home totally. and you, you can still smell your spouse. Totally. And it says it's so bizarre. I mean, well, I mean let's talk about that. You know, the, the grief process that you've gone through, you know, a lot of people assume that, you know, time heals all wounds and grief progresses in this sort of linear f- fashion. Has that been your experience with grief? No, I mean, yes and no. I think the pain is certainly less than it was before. So like it has gotten better over time, of course, but I think the like linear stages of grief thing or predictable stages is like 
not has not been my experience. I think it's much more like waves of an ocean or like there's all kinds of other metaphors that people use. And then, I mean, I got to do a book tour for Paul after Paul died. And it was actually so amazing. Paul's book came out nine months after he died. And right around the time where I was like still so hungry to talk about him and he was still so present in my everyday thoughts. And I love him no less than I did before. You know, he's like, he's still a part of my experience. And and the chance to talk about him or even to you, you know, he died four years ago and it's so fun to tell you about him. And I've even fallen in love since Paul died. And I also still love Paul and Paul's still Katie's dad. And so I think the the ex- positive experience of doing this book tour after Paul died has taught me so much about grief and how helpful it can be to, to acknowledge that like that love totally continues and the desire to, you know, Talk about the person continues. Sheryl Sandberg, after her husband died suddenly, wrote about going to this dinner party and everybody was telling like the meet cute stories of how they met their spouses. And then they skipped over her. And I, and she was like, I totally have a story about how I met Dave. And like people felt weird asking about it or maybe thought it wasn't important anymore. And she was like so shocked and was ready to tell the story. And I've had so much opportunity to like tell the stories and it's been so awesome. And then it's just been interesting, like raising a kid into a world that includes like visiting a grave, you know, and she's like, that's just her world. And she's totally, she takes it totally in stride. She gets it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, going back to this idea of how other people respond who are like outside of this process, right? Mm -hmm. I think all of us have known someone who's going through a hard time. A spouse has a terminal illness. A friend has a terminal illness. You know, someone loses their spouse suddenly. And people want to help. They want to say something, but they're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing. I mean, going through your experience with, with Paul and even as your experience as a doctor, do you have any advice to folks who want to help know someone who's having a hard time, but they just don't know what to do or say? Sure. I mean, my main advice is just like, do the thing. So like, that's everything from like, write the card, go to the memorial service, like knock on the door, say the thing, just like do the thing if you if it occurs to you. And it's just so much harder to feel isolated and disconnected. And I think anytime somebody reached out to me with anything, which happened a lot, felt so good. I was not analyzing what people were saying. I was just analyzing how it made me feel to be connected. And then, and I think my mom always used to give us this advice growing up where she would say, when in doubt, describe. And it was good relationship advice. It was like, you don't have to have the perfect thing to say. You can just sort of describe even that. So it's like, you could say to your friend, like, I was so sorry to hear your mom died that hasn't happened to me and I don't even really know what to say about it. I've just been thinking about you so much and it brings tears to my eyes and I just wanted to come over. And it's like, wouldn't that be such a nice thing to hear? It's like, I think, I think when in doubt describe is really pretty good um, because even if all you can say is, I wish I knew what to say, I love you. That's awesome. Is Are there things that you like people shouldn't say like ever, right? <laughs> Well, like you don't, cause you, you don't appreciate maybe. it. It doesn't help. Yeah. So I think I'm in a um, Facebook group that's, well, now it's on this other app platform called Band, but it's called Hot Young Widows Club. And it's, it was founded by Nora McInerney. And it's a group of like all relatively young people who've lost their spouse or partner in their twenties or thirties. And it's awesome. It's amazing. But the two things that people really don't like to hear are, well, the main one is everything happens for a reason or like, like he's in a better place. Like anything that feels like it's trying to explain something away or anything that's trying to explain, explain it, which, because I think these things just are pretty inexplicable. And oftentimes what you want is just someone to acknowledge how hard it is and then like see it and sit there and rather than trying to make it better or fix it, especially when that's impossible. What, what have you noticed or been helpful or that you've appreciated like in the months or years since Paul's death, right? I mean, one thing I've, I've talked to people who've 
lost a spouse, people remember you like right after, but then after a while, the phone calls start going away. People, I mean, did you have people who kept on, who kept in constant touch with you even after months after it? Yes. Yeah, totally. And I think maybe my friends just knew that intuitively or, or maybe it also really came out of Paul's book because there was enough to talk about with the book and the book tour and how's the book doing and, you know, that it, Paul and the book became really wrapped together. And so it's the degree to which I've had the chance to talk about Paul's writing feels totally like commensurate with the need I have to talk about Paul. So, and I think that's not true for everybody. So I think you're really hitting on something, which is like, you know, I have a friend whose son died uh, about a year after Paul died. And I like marked the calendar for like the day of the month that he died to like send her a text every once in a while. And he would have been starting kindergarten now. And she just mentioned that two people texted her to say like, Hey, I see there's all the kindergarten photos on Facebook, like just checking in with you. Cause I know that your son would have been starting kindergarten. It's like, it totally doesn't go away. It's like, you think about the person at big milestones or the anniversary that they died on or their birthday. It's like, if it would ever occur to you to mark your calendar, to check in with someone like, I could almost guarantee that 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 person is thinking about it. And it it feels awesome to even just get a text. You're totally right. So Paul was a philosopher. I'm going to say, I mean, I, I, that's what I think. He was a, I think a philosopher first and he became a doctor. <laughs> He's sort of like William James. Like William James was probably a philosopher and he became a psychologist because he wanted to understand things Love better. Um, but Montague, the, the French essayist, he said, the study of philosophy is to learn to die well. Do you think Paul succeeded in that? Oh, um, I think so. I mean, I think he really faced up to it and he really tried to live authentically. And I think, um, I think in a way, like, I don't know what a good death means or dying well means. It's like, it's just, it's not something that we want to do. And, but I think like, Dying well, it, to me, is like pretty similar to living well, you know? It's like until you die, you're alive. And so it's all it's all your life, you know? So yeah, I mean, I think so. I'm, I'm proud of him for that. So and, I guess, yes. And, and do you think that he got some of the answers to those questions you've had since he was a young man, you know, in the Arizona desert? Like he, he got an idea of what made human life meaningful? <sighs> Are you asking me what's the meaning of life? No, wait, well, do you, <laughs> but, but, but do, you, do you think Paul had? Yeah. Maybe, maybe he couldn't articulate it, but do you think he had a sense? Like he grasped yeah, I do. It? Yeah. I do. Um, I do. And it's like, when, after Paul died, one of his friends said, you know, I wonder if Paul felt like the struggle to find meaning is, the, is part of the meaning. And I kind of do think that. I think when Breath Becomes Air is about what you mentioned, it's like, it's about love and suffering and striving. And... Those are the things that Viktor Frankl said were meaningful to those are the things he said underpin meaning is like love and the people and experiences we love work like our work or our purpose and then suffering and how facing suffering is intrinsically meaningful sort of counterintuitively right and I think I think love and striving and suffering um were and service, you know, I think we're really meaningful to Paul and they kind of swirl around in the book. But I picture Katie growing up to read the book. And I think when she reads it, I hope that, that, you know, it's essentially saying like, it's important to try hard and I love you. Like that's what the book's saying to Katie, I think. And I, I kind of think that's indistinct from ultimately what Paul thought was really important in his life. Well, Lucy, this has been a great conversation. Is there some place people can go to learn more about the book? Well, let me think of what, so, so it's When Breath Becomes Air. It's wherever books are sold. There is a website called paulcolonathy.com that has some old interviews with Paul and then some speaking events and other projects that I'm doing. And then I'm on Twitter. If anybody wants to communicate with me, I'm at rocketgirlmd on Twitter. Awesome. Well, Lucy Colonathy, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.
My guest today was Dr. Luthi Kalanithi. She wrote the epilogue to her late husband's book, Paul Kalanithi. The book is When Breath Becomes Air. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can find out more information about Paul and his life at the website paulkalanithi.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash breathbecomesair. You can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.